www.ipm.org. Hit play to be inspired. We ain't got no other way to go but up. To be informed. This is New England Public Media News. To explore. Amazing. And to meet your neighbors. I spoke with Green to learn more about his creative process. Hit play for New England Public Media. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. What's a summer festival without music, craft beer, and food? Make a day of the NEPM Asparagus Festival, Saturday, June 4th, on the Hadley Town Common. With American roots from Session Americana, the Latin rhythms of Mamzelle Ruiz, and the powerful vocals of local singer Kamaya Diggs. Your favorite local craft beers and plenty of Pioneer Valley Eats, all in support of New England Public Media. See the food and beer lineup at nepm.org slash asparagus. Coming up, we're connecting you with the creativity and culture in your community, including an artistic exploration of social justice issues. I'm just trying to document the reality of life, and what folks take away from that is on an individual level, but I hope they feel something. Bringing inclusivity to local musical theater. You make yourself stronger when you work with each other. And you make yourself stronger when you offer that opportunity. And we're in the south end of Springfield today to explore some of its culture and history. I've been playing Pachi for since I was two years old. I used to play in Italy. I come to Springfield. I've been playing Pachi with my toy like little kids. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. We're coming to you today from the south end of the city of Springfield in Hamden County. This community has long been a stronghold of Italian culture built by immigrants who came here and opened up businesses, raised their children and made their homes in this part of the city. We'll explore how the Italian community in the South End has both endured and changed over the years a bit later in the program. But we begin our show just a mile down the road from here in the Art Gallery at Springfield Technical Community College. May is National Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And so in honor of that, today we're bringing you a profile of local artists whose work draws from, among other things, her AAPI heritage. Donna Bell Cassis is a Filipina American artist living and working in Western Massachusetts. Her art is influenced by various sources such as Filipino tribal tattoos and textiles, facial recognition software, cosmology, and the philosophy of metaphysics. Her most recent work is a 3D moving mobile art installation, and producer Dave Frazier brings us her story. Time and space can be two important elements to a visual artist who wants to create innovative work. For artist Donna Bell Cassis, she had both recently at the Amy H. Carberry Gallery on the campus of Springfield Technical Community College. I've been lucky to use this space for the entire month of April and um, since then I've created almost 20 pieces and counting. Seeing my work up outside of my studio is always kind of a, an exciting aspect. I never really know what to expect, uh, especially with this installation. Um, I'm working as I'm going, so it's constantly a surprise whenever I make something and hang it up and see it in the space. Trained as a painter, Cassis used the gallery and studio space to expand on her mastery of two-dimensional artwork to include large three-dimensional pieces. Mobiles made of random shapes, colors, and sizes hung from the ceiling. Materials included laser-cut aluminum as well as fabric and capri shells that she had sent to her from the Philippines. The other half of the gallery included her work area, a table with paints and materials, as well as a spray tent for airbrushing. The message behind looking at my art is, is multifold, I think. A lot of it is just take the time and look, um, because a lot of the work I do is based on visual perception, sort of how we take what we see and find meaning. 
I created a private commission, I, I created a hanging mobile, um, which isn't actually far from here, uh, and it gave me an opportunity to explore kinetic art and um, using my work in a 3D form, and so I thought, why don't I explore that a little bit more and do it large scale. Fascinated by visual perception and how meaning is derived from what we see, Cassis looks for hidden geometries that may connect discrete perspectives to form a greater whole. I'm interested in markers of identity, sort of how we uh, express ourselves in the world, uh, be it through our patterns of thought, patterns that we wear, um, patterns in our daily lives, and uh, markers of identity mean what you want to express about yourself without language necessarily. In her native country of the Philippines, these markers of identity are quite often found in the form of tattoos, and Cassis had an opportunity to experience this traditional tribal ritual firsthand. I actually traveled to the Philippines for the first time since I was two years old. Uh, I hadn't returned since to go get tattooed by the oldest living tattoo artist who's 103 years old. She is the last of the headhunter tattooers, and I had to um, trek 10 hours into the rainforest to meet her. And um, these are official tattoos. They, they, um, they use the hand tapping technique with a thorn, um, soot from the fire, and uh, bamboo sticks, and tap the design into your skin. This inaugural artist-in-residence opportunity was a unique experience for both artist and gallery. And since the pandemic, the gallery has been exploring ways to serve and support local and regional artists in non-traditional ways. Having access to art is so important as part of our daily lives. Uh, it creates a certain um, perspective on the human experience and you know once we have access to that human experience it reminds us of how amazing we are and how creative we are so the more access we have um, to these spaces I think will enable other people to be equally inspired. And if you enjoyed that story, be sure to go online right now to nepm.org slash connecting point as we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in May with a look at some of the people, stories, and issues that shape the AAPI experience in Western Massachusetts. We're coming to you today from Springfield South End, an area known far and wide for its Italian culture, food, and heritage. But our next story takes us north to the Franklin County city of Greenfield. On May 20th and 21st, award-winning photographer and writer Alfonso Neal's new exhibit entitled Struggle and Hope, Documenting Modern America, will be on display in Greenfield as part of the Lava Center's Social Justice in the Arts and Media series. The exhibition will feature photographs accompanied by the written and recorded voices of Neil's subjects and spans seven years of social justice movements throughout the United States and Mexico. I joined Neil at the Lava Center to learn more about his work. I was working as a union organizer in St. Louis in 2014 um, and in August was when Michael Brown was murdered and everything just happened. Um, and it was a moment in, in my lifetime that I never thought I would be experiencing. You know, it was something that I'd read about in history books. It was, it was very much a part of what I had learned about the history here in the U.S., but never something that I thought would be repeating itself. Uh, I thought we had already gotten past that. So I had no choice but to be present for it. And while organizing and working with folks in that community, I just decided to pick up my camera again and start taking photos. Um, and it just continued in that way. You mentioned, you know, like you didn't realize history was going to be repeating itself. And I had spoken to you a little earlier and said, when I was viewing these photos, it took me a second to realize that these weren't from 30, 40, 50 years ago. These were relatively recent. And so in these photos, there are four intersectional themes um, that are featured. Can you talk to me about those and how they present themselves throughout the exhibit? Yeah, so the four themes are uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the crisis at the southern border, the UAW strike, and uh, low-wage workers. And how do we see all of those movements kind of um, talk through your photos? I would say 
through the photos, we can see the intersectionality of how all of these struggles are connected and how everyone is fighting to improve their lives, to find that level of dignity and respect, whether it be in the community, through work, um, mitigating police violence through, you know, ending it, to be completely honest, and creating ways in which we as a society and a culture uh, work to mutually benefit each other. Now let's talk about the black and white photos for a second. Um, there's 20 of them featured in this exhibit. Why did you choose to go black and white? What does it add to the story? Because it takes away distractions. I have nothing against shooting color photos or anything, but you know, it, it's, it's very shiny. It's very much, you look at the colorful images and then you are in the moment looking at the photo and then you're out of the moment just as quickly. Uh, when it comes to being black and white, you think to yourself, oh, is this moment present? Did this moment happen a long time ago? And it also forces you to take your time in reading the image because it's not gonna be instantaneously gonna make sense. It's not gonna be, oh, I saw the photo, I'm gonna look away. It's gonna be, I see this photo, I see the pain, I see the hope, I see the struggle, I see the moment. Let me stare at it for a little bit longer and look around at what else is happening in that scene, you know, looking past the, the main subject. And speaking of seeing the images, one of the ones that stood out for me, it was a mother and daughter in Mexico outside a temporary home. And it just, they seemed so normal just standing there, you know, having a moment, but you can just tell the situation was far from normal. Is there an image or images um, that speak to you the most from this exhibit? And if so, why? I would say there are two images that speak uh, to me the most. Uh, the first one uh, was taken in Nogales, Mexico, right on the border with Arizona. And it's a mother and a little boy staring through the barbed wire fences at the border crossing. It was the, just the look that the little boy was giving me, something that just made me feel like that could have been myself. And then the second image is of an unnamed black activist uh, right in the first few weeks of Ferguson, staring at a very intimidating line of riot police. It, it was a visual representation of how monumental this challenge is to figure how do we dismantle systemic racism and police brutality in a way that will benefit the community that's most affected by it. And, you know, it, it, it just, it, you know, it, it does feel like just one person fighting against an entire machine. Now, this is really heavy subject matter that you're covering, um, and it even, like you said, has a personal connection to you. How do you manage the emotions that you feel while you are in these moments documenting these things? In the moment, I don't really feel a lot of the emotion because I'm very much trying to be uh, almost like a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not trying to interject myself into the moment because it's not about me. It's about everyone else but me. Mm -hmm. But usually after it happens and you go back and you hear the testimony or the recordings, you start to transcribe it, then you start editing photos. Uh, for me, I just get this overwhelming weight on my shoulders um, because it is very personal for me and it is something that I really never thought I would be experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm also really happy that I'm able to feel all of these emotions, anger, sadness, pain, shame for what has happened um, because it reminds me that through it all we're, we're human beings, that we feel and that's an important thing to, to be able to do. Every week, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Opened in 2020, Greenfield's Lava Center is an arts incubator, black box theater, and community space. The center's goal is to create opportunities in the performing and literary arts, and I spoke with the center's leadership to find out what it offers to the community. We are a small space, and we are generally a very casual space. You know, I think of us as very welcoming. You know, people just kind of pop in, and they're like, oh, what's going on? And we're like, come on in, hang out, you know, do something. And I think people really are responding to that very casual, welcoming, inclusive 
uh, space that we have and this just this uh, attitude that we have about the arts as being for everyone, as being a vital part of the community. You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. Many metropolitan areas boast pocket communities based around the ethnicity of its residents, and the city of Springfield is no exception. This area right here, better known as the south end of the city, has a rich and proud heritage born from the Italian immigrants who made it their home. But as Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan shows us, while the Little Italy section of the city has certainly gotten a little bit littler over the past few decades, the sense of community and tradition here is just as strong as ever. It's safe to say that when the good people of Springfield traveled to the south end of town back in 1946, there was no MGM Casino or CVS or even a Route 91 for that matter. There are plenty of other storefronts that wouldn't have been found down this way back then either, but there is one that never left. And while La Fiorentina Pastry Shop may not have always been located right here at the corner of Maine and Winthrop, this has always been their neighborhood. We are kind of a, a meeting place for the Italian American community in the greater Springfield area. A any given morning you'll find you know, tables of, of old Italian guys, young Italian guys, doctors, lawyers, plumbers, mechanics, all sitting at a table, all just shooting the breeze um, and, you know, just, just enjoying a cup of espresso. Yeah. At the front of the house, there are display cases loaded with countless reasons as to why home exercise equipment is still a booming business. These exquisite confectionery creations are made daily back here, where the aroma of almonds and sweetness fill the air like something out of a dream. For anyone who's never seen the inner workings of a traditional bakery, it's really quite fascinating to witness the assembly line atmosphere, in particular with their cakes, which have played a major role in their ability to have lifelong customers. We are not only a multi-generational business in terms of ownership, but also in terms of clientele. So my grandfather, you know, the, the brines I'm working with and the couples I'm working with today, my grandparents made cakes for their grandparents or great-grandparents, and then my parents made their wedding cake for their parents. We want to see you for your first anniversary cake, and then, you know, your kid's baptism cake, and the first birthday. And if La Fiorentina is where people go for their treats, next door at Mom and Rico Daniele's Specialty Market is where folks in the neighborhood can go for, well, just about everything else. We have a little bit of everything. We sell bocce balls, we sell uh, buffet, we sell grinders and sandwiches, we have we sell a little bit of everything, uh, macaroni, pasta, toilet paper, uh, <laughs> wedding soup, divorce soup, chicken tortellini soup, pasta fagioli. We have raviolis and tortellinis, a little bit of everything. When we dropped by, Rico was working with his sisters Gina and Rosemary, putting together quite possibly the most delicious prosciutto sauce I've ever tasted. But looking around the store, it's nearly impossible not to notice the importance that the game of bocce plays in his life. He even wrote a book on it. In fact, he likes it so much, he named a sandwich for it, the Bocce Bella Grinder. And when he's not here running the shop, chances are Rico can be found at one of the local bocce courts. Thank you. They say the first known documentation of bocce was in 5200 BC, with an Egyptian tomb painting that depicted two boys playing. Whatever the story may be, for the guys we met at the Dante Club in West Springfield, it's a game they've been playing for as long as they can remember. I've been playing bocce for since I was two years old. It's my toy. I, I guess you can't afford to buy any toy way back in Italy. So I come, I used to play in Italy, I come in Springfield, I've been playing bocce with my toy like little kids. To play bocce, it's one of the cheapest sports to buy bocce. Bocce said it only costs $100, 150 dollars and you're good for life. It's not like you play golf or play uh, hockey or play uh, football. You need a lot of money. Bocce is a very cheap sport to do. It's very fun for everybody. And it's a tradition that the younger generation seems to be missing out on. But Rico Daniele is doing all he can to change that. 
But I, what I like to do, because we don't do it anymore, I like to get the kids to play with the parents and grandparents. In bocce, is a special game or any age, any size, any shape. You could be in a wheelchair and play bocce. It's a beautiful game. It brings people together. We need more of that today. Today, we don't eat around that kitchen table with that family. We got to do things with that family today. That way, there's less bullying or less fighting and bring people together. Whether it's meeting up for a game of bocce with some friendly trash talking or getting together for a cup of espresso, sense of community is still strong here. But will the South End ever be the old neighborhood that it used to be back in the day? Probably not. But uh, maybe that's not necessarily such a bad thing. In terms of, you know, Italians coming back to the South End, I, I don't really see it happening. You know, they've moved out to East Long Meadow, Long Meadow, Aguam. Um, and, you know, they, they're well established there. They, they made a little bit of money, they worked hard, made some money, moved out to the suburbs. And I guess that, in a way, is, is the real American dream, right? But a as long as we can, we're going to be here and we, we still plan on being a, a meeting place and, and a community landmark as long as people still want to keep coming. And if you love local history, head over to Connecting Point Online for a digital extra as we learn about the one little village in Salerno, Italy, that produced most of the Italian immigrant population who settled right here in Springfield, South End area. It's a small town in the province of Salerno, which is southern Italy, about 40, 45 minutes south of Naples. And I'd venture to say there's more people from Brasiliano in the city of Springfield than there are actually in Brasiliano now. You can find that digital extra on our webpage right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. From May 20th through the 22nd, the Opera House Players in Enfield, Connecticut will be presenting special performances of the Tony Award winning musical Next to Normal. This show is described as a shadowed production which fully incorporates a dual cast of hearing and speaking performers and American Sign Language performers. I spoke with the show's director, Sharon Fitzhenry, to learn more about the production and the importance of inclusivity in the creative arts. For us, we have created an entirely dual cast. So we have a cast entirely of singing, speaking actors, and then we have a cast that are performing entirely in American Sign language in ASL. So normally when people think about a signed performance, the interpreter is off to the side and they're not actively involved in the production. For us, every character has two performers. So you might have two Dianas that are next to each other. Maybe they're in opposite and frame the stage. They interact. Sometimes they share signs. They share activity. So the two casts are entirely integrated and they shadow each other, you know, in motion and in emotion. We, we consider it to be different nuances of the same character. Well, I was going to mention um, that being bilingual myself, I understand the challenges of trying to accurately translate something and stay true to the original material. Um, so what have you learned um, as a production about putting together a, a presentation in this shadowed style? Oh, I've learned a lot and, and I can guarantee you that there is so much more I need to learn. We've tried very, very hard to be authentic to the deaf performers and to deaf culture to make sure that we are honoring that uh, in, its, in its essence and not trying to make it just a gimmick you know, it, it's not that. These are really talented actors, really talented performers. And so I challenge folks to come see this performance for their work. It doesn't matter what language they're using. They're telling this story so richly and, and emotively. It's been wonderful. But I have to give huge credit to our director of artistic sign language, Nikki Malik. She glossed the script, which is translating it into American Sign Language making sure that both companies were using the signs that were appropriate to the moment. I mean, there's a lot that I've learned about sign language. Sign language has regional translation, like we think of accents, you know, phrasings, um, phrasings that were current right now that maybe weren't necessarily in use 10 years or 20 or 30 years ago. So she's done an enormous amount of work um, and done a beautiful job bringing this forward in ASL.
Next to Normal is a Tony Award winning musical, and it has been chosen as one of the year's 10 shows that you must see um, from critics from the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Rolling Stone, so much more. Why did you decide to produce this play um, for the Connecticut audience? Why did it make sense for Next to Normal um, to happen this year? Well, for one, you want to choose a show that has a really amazing story and has gorgeous music. And that may seem like a funny thing to say when you're looking at translating a musical into sign language, but the lyricism of it, the, the, the way that characters move and interact. And then at the basis of it, this is a play about miscommunication. This is a play about not recognizing each other. Uh, relationship is really story forward. And so all of that could come together in order to bring the ASL to a point of focus that was appropriate. And it worked really well. You know, for a character to say, you don't hear me, well, is that because the speaking actor is talking to the ASL actor? So there's lots of little things that we played on in nuance. The last nights of the show are coming up this week. Yeah. And it's been a long month and of great shows. What will you miss the most and what are you most proud of with this production? I will miss the company. I mean, it's been 12 actors that have just poured their hearts out. I'm proud of us taking a chance, you know, regardless of how it lands, regardless of what an audience thinks when they walk out, I think it was important that we took the chance. I directed Next to Normal many years ago, and it was really um, kind of about the mental health issues of the story. This time it's been about relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that relationship that I built with Nikki, our Dazzle, the relationship that the actors have made within the partners, the two Natalies, the two Henrys. Um, I'd like to think that we're all a little richer for it. And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. Our thanks to the city of Springfield and the residents of the South End for hosting us today. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and take care. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Los Asparagos, las cervezas, las bandas. Es el regreso del Festival del Espárago de NEPM, marcando el comienzo del verano. Acompaña a Curious George y Nature Cat de PBS Kids en el evento comunitario de la temporada. Visita a los agricultores y artesanos locales, baila al ritmo de la música en vivo de las bandas de Signature Sounds y prueba docenas de opciones de comida local y cervezas artesanales. El Festival del Espárago de NEPM, sábado 4 de junio en el Hadley Town Common. Detalles en NEPM.org, Asparagus. If you'd like to woo not one, but two married ladies, take it from Shakespeare. The more you woo, the more you suffer. Are these your letters? <laughs> Just for fun, join us when Shakespeare in the Park presents the Merry Wives of Harlem on great performances. What's up, New York? Watch Merry Wives Friday at 9 or stream at nepm.org. PBS Kids has helped me as a teacher in countless ways. I use Nature Cat in my classroom, and there's an amazing episode about butterflies. So the kids got to watch the caterpillars change and watch Nature Cat clips about that. Tally ho! His tally ho became a rally cry. <laughs> PBS Kids helps my students learn more about the world around them.
world events for 30. 36 local high school teams went head to head during the 61st season of At Schools Match Wits. Long Meadow. New Hampshire. New Hampshire, yes. And now it's down to the final three. In the second semifinal match this Saturday, Hall High takes on Westfield. Hall. Kentucky. Kentucky. Westfield. Afghanistan. Afghanistan, yes. And the winning team will meet Long Meadow in the championship match May 28th. As Schools Match Wits, Saturday night at 7 on NEPM and streaming at NEPM.org. Hey, I'm Rick Steves. You know, I don't go anywhere without my passport. And now, thanks to PBS Passport, you can travel with me and watch all 10 seasons of Rick Steves Europe and all my travel specials. This exclusive streaming service is just for our members. Not only can you see all my shows, but you can see thousands of hours of your favorite public television shows. Become a member today and get your passport. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. This is the opportunity to share my story. To be here was a huge surprise. We want to fall in love with your recipes. I am ready. I'm excited. I'm going to do it. I'm so excited to be competing for one of my recipes to become a tradition for other people. This is a dish that my dad taught me. It's the flavors of home. Welcome to the Great American Recipe. The Great American Recipe premieres June 24th on 